there, and welcome to this uh, cool edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth McCoy, your host, and yes, I'm out here braving the cold elements. It's min it's three degrees Celsius, but with a wind chill, it's minus something. So, but hey, I got to get this reviewing because I don't have this uh, vehicle for much longer. I'm very happy to have with me here a 2024 Kia EV9 all electric. Yes my EV car of the year. And I want to first start off by thanking Kia Canada for allowing me the early use of this vehicle. There's a lineup of journalists in Canada a mile long that want to get their hands behind this. And I'm one of the first few to be able to get to spend some time with one of these beasts uh, in the press fleet. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Kia Canada. You know who you are. Really appreciate it. And as, you've, as you can tell by my voice, even though it's cold, I'm excited. I'm warm inside because this vehicle is just absolutely fantastic. And now that I've had a, some time to spend a few days with it, my opinion is even better than it was prior to getting the vehicle for this amount of time. So uh, sit back and relax. I'm going to tell you all about this vehicle. This is going to be a fairly detailed review. So it's going to be a long episode. I'm going to try to explore some more of the nooks and crannies of this vehicle that I normally don't get deeply in. Just, just to show you, you know, what Kia has put into this vehicle, a lot of thought and effort and, and pleasantries that you will like if, if you're into that stuff. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and thanks for tuning in. Now, what makes this vehicle so excited here from Kia as we start looking at it, you know, it's a big box, right? It's a pretty big full-size SUV. In fact, it's the first really true mass market three-row all-electric SUV. There are lots of three-row SUVs on the marketplace, and I'm going to talk about competitive products uh, near the end of the show when I talk about pricing, just to kind of show you what else is out there, especially from an all-electric perspective. This is really the first mass market, and, and Kia states that, and I say that, because of the price point of this vehicle. My understanding is that Kia is looking to produce a lot of these vehicles. If you, if you come and say mass market and just throw 20,000 vehicles out there, to me, that's not mass market. So we're going to wait and see how this year shapes up. But I know they've already delivered 500 in Canada at the end of the last year, and yet by the end of December, I'm already seeing more on the roads. I see a couple in my neighborhood already, uh, and it's only here in March. So they are starting to pump these things out. And again, they're all built in South Korea, so it's a global assembly, and they're, they're shipped across the world. A lot, a lot of demand. It's really important for Kia, if they're going to step up and say mass market, that they actually, one, have the numbers to back it up. So we'll wait and see, but I'm confident they will. And two, is the price point at an attractive price where it can get more people involved in purchasing an all-electric vehicle, especially people that need a full-size SUV, a three-row, or just the space, the capacity to move stuff and people around, tow some stuff, things like that. And I will, again, talk about pricing at the end of this episode, but they've hit it out of the park. And I said this when I had uh, did a quick review at my Ajax Test Fest episode. So if you go back into late September and check that one out, you'll see that I spend an hour with this and I give you my initial thoughts. And that was in a pre-production unit and it was already rock solid. So these productions are just fantastic. So a combination of the availability and the price point in a very hot, hot, hot market. You know, I can't say enough that the full-size SUV market is just crazy. Come here to Southern Ontario, go to a Costco parking lot, to a mall parking lot, eight out of 10 cars are SUVs or pickup trucks. That's the way, that's the reality of the situation here in Canada, just in urbanite and in suburban settings. This is what's popular. Go to the US, same thing. Seven out of 10 people, eight out of 10 are driving SUVs and pickup trucks. That's just the way the market is here in North America. So for Kia to go after it in a big way, my, my, my uh, you know, it's really, uh, I applaud them for that. So Kia's come a long way, right? They see the future, right? They're, they're you know, they want to be carbon neutral by 2043 or 2045 or something like that. So they're taking steps to get there and all electrification is very important in their product portfolio. So this vehicle from a design perspective is kind of the new language that we're going to see from Kia moving forward. We're not going to get, you know, 0.2 uh, drag coefficients and stuff like that, right? Folks, you're seeing by all the pictures, but it's a very attractive looking SUV. I've got lots of people look at this, stopping at a light, people are glancing over, looking at it, going, what is that thing? It's big, you sit tall, it's a big vehicle, full size again, seven passenger variants. This is the six passenger variant option because it has the mid row captain's chairs. So you can get it in six or seven passengers and still carry stuff. You can tow up to 5,000 pounds. You can put a roof rack on it and do all kinds of stuff, put bikes and cargo carriers and whatever you want. If you want to put tents on top, why not? You could probably do that as well. You know, all that kind of stuff. So this is an adventure vehicle like some other um, 
EV companies uh, advertise, yet it's a very capable city vehicle and, and hauling the kids around or stuff or work, going to back and forth to work or whatever you need to do, family, all that kind of stuff. So it's an extremely capable vehicle. And the design really shows that. You know, it's not trying to say, look, I'm this big outdoor thing that I'm going to climb, you know, um, uh, the valleys in Moab and all this kind of stuff. That's not what I'm designed to do. I'm designed to haul people and stuff around in a comfortable manner, in a very safe way, in a very controlled way, and as efficient as I can get out of the battery range on this vehicle. And you'll be surprised at the ranges for something like this. It's actually really, really good. And Kia's done a great job of BMS wrapping, mapping. So to kind of end the design and, and, and all that kind of stuff, the looks of this, I think it's a fantastic looking vehicle. I love every nook and cranny of this thing. Everything has been thought out and purposeful, the lighting treatments, all that stuff really is kind of the, ne the next level of design for them. And I applaud Kia for that. And a couple of things I wanted to mention before we continue on looking at the vehicle is that this is so important to Kia. This is their second dedicated EV, right? That the EV6 is their first one carrying in the EV, EV namesake family with the nine. They plan to have 15 full electric EV models within the next three years. That's quite an aggressive timeline. So continue to watch their space and see what they come up with. I've already mentioned the five and the three are in the pipeline now. Um, and the, with this one and the EV, six that'll make four vehicles right so they got a whole lot more they want to come out with so look at that again keeping this a lot of the same technology so we saw it in the refresh nero this this pretty similar ui and and you'll see when i go inside and show you the interior the interfaces and the screens are very similar now they're keeping the same kind of consistent um, visual aspect language fonts all that kind of usability very similar across all these platforms and that's a good thing right you want to get to economies of scale so Let's standardize and get it going. It looks really nice, though. I really like this new displays. You know, keeping with a lot of technology and their ADAS systems, of course, supporting full over-the-air updates as well in this vehicle. So, again, everybody's catching on to what Tesla has started. You will be able to get updates on this vehicle on a regular basis. And, you know, this is a three-row vehicle, right, as I mentioned. And, and I kind of frown a little bit on some three rows because that third row is really, really tight and really, really small and, and kind of there for kids and... You know, maybe in an emergency you can you can throw somebody there for a, for a short trip, but you know, as far as longer comfort level, they're a little challenging. But Kia's actually nailed this one. If you're six foot two, I wouldn't want you to sit in that third row for a long time. It's going to be cramped, but it's not impossible for you to get in there and sit and have some sort of comfort level for a period of time. Um, and that's what they've done. They've done a really good job at ergonomics in this vehicle to not only encapsulate total volume, because it's a big, big rectangle box, right, on a platform, but to also capitalize on, on, on how they position the seats and giving you the leg room and the headroom that you need to, feed, to be fairly comfortable in that third row. So I think they've done a great job on that. So let me tell you a little bit more about the powertrain and some of the specs on this vehicle. So as I mentioned, this is a EV platform designed up, right, in, in that eGMP platform. And, you know, they call this the tiger mask kind of view. I forgot to mention that in the design, but whatever. Everybody has their names. I guess so. You know, go with it, right? Lots of digital, all that kind of stuff. Um, really, as I mentioned, really good space in the rows. Lots of glass as well. So visibility is excellent on this vehicle. And that flat floor, again, with an all-electric, gives you a lot more room uh, when you have that uh, that uh, kind of foundation to build on. Now from a power perspective this uh, does have a front so I'm going to open that up and I'll talk about cargo in a sec but obviously it's on a light so there's no motor here. You don't see an engine, you don't see any of that. Large crumple zones, right? But from a power this comes out a few different variants so I'm going to focus on Canadian specs for your region, your check, your, your, the naming of the trims and the specs are probably going to be different so you need to check your local websites. We have a couple of ranges and a couple of battery sizes that we can look at. Uh, from a battery size perspective there's a standard range and a long range. In the standard range it comes in, in uh, one version only which is a rear wheel drive rear-wheel drive standard range, um, giving you, with one motor, the motor pumps out about 215 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. That's plenty, even though this is a 6,000 pound vehicle or coming up to that weight class, it's still enough to get this thing going in an adequate fashion. The long range single motor to me is the sweet spot for this vehicle. It is, you know, pushing almost 500 kilometers of range. Uh, out of that 100 kilowatt hour battery pack on the single motor, that's what I would go for personally because I, I think over I think all wheel drives overrated, and I think people are relying on technology more than driving skills nowadays in driving in cold climates. That's my my two cents worth, and I'm going to get off the soapbox on that. 
So again, comes with that base, comes in two trims, either a base rear wheel drive with the same specs I just mentioned in horsepower and torque. Add a second motor to the front to add that all wheel drive, really bumps it up to 379 horsepower, 516 pound-feet of torque. That really gets you going. And now your range goes from about 270, 280 miles or so to about, to about 390, 450 kilometers, depending on, on uh, some, of the, some of the options you put in that thing. So uh, it's really, really, really good from that perspective. But again, that long range, um, single motor variant, you know, 304 miles, 489 kilometers. So if you want the longest range, the rear wheel drive is the way you go. So it's, it's a trade-off. Again, if, you know, I, I wouldn't do any heavy trailing on this vehicle. You could certainly do some light road off, uh, off-roading to do that. And I mentioned up to 5,000 pounds of towing capacity. You can get a trailer hitch option and all kinds of stuff for this. So uh, wiring, so it does come with all that stuff. Very, very well-equipped vehicle with these kind of specs for the class that it's in. The Kia uh, hasn't yet started building cars with the NACS standard, but they have committed to it. So right now when you open the charging port, you get a standard CCS combo uh, capable machine. This little flap pulls out and there's your faster charging capabilities. But I, they're going to do two things, like most of the other OEMs are going to supply adapters at some point so that you can take this into an NACS um, uh, uh, supercharger environment for those that have that and uh, or, and uh, I believe starting in 2025, 2026 time frame depending on the models then you'll start seeing natively the North American standard port. So nice charging port, easy to operate, open and close, all that kind of stuff. If I can find the right button, there you go. So we look at a cargo capacity, that's what these things are for, right? Carrying people and stuff. And this has a pretty good element of cargo. Nice power lift gate, which you can control the height, of course, on, let that open. So I've got some stuff in here already with all my camera gear and stuff. And as you can see, it's, it's uh, a pretty good couple of feet of space here between the, the lip and to the third row. I've got the third row up right now. Uh, but certainly, now this uh, is the GT line option and it has the, the premium package, I believe, or the top end option package which gives you power everything for all these secondary seating the middle captain seats and the back row which means that a push of a button that i can lower these seats and i'll show you some b-roll while i'm talking about that but um, so when you open start open lowering these seats you open up the cargo capacity and with the way you see it right now this is about 20 cubic feet of storage here so if you lower um uh, the second and the third rows down, you get a combination of 82 uh, cubic feet of space. Um, and I, I use, here's some pictures of the frunk, obviously. It's a small frunk, 3.2 cubic feet. It's your standard, kind of what we've seen from the South Koreans from a frunk, right? They give you enough to put a charging cable, some books, maybe some emergency gear, that kind of stuff. That's really what they're designed to do. Maybe a very small, small uh, travel bag if you have something like a gym bag or something there, or a small knapsack. So you, you can put something there in there, obviously, but a really good amount of cargo space here. Uh, and that's what it's all about. So if you need to lug stuff, you need to go camping and you need to throw some stuff in here, uh, that's what it's for. Nice, uh, even though this is a higher vehicle, um, I like that the lift over is still easy enough to kind of pick something up and lift it up. You don't have to kind of lift it up a lot higher like you may do in some of the higher SUVs that uh, really, really have a high stance. So they've done a good job there too. Now there is a little storage under here just to lift it up, just enough to actually to put charging cables, books, manuals. There's a spare, um, not a spare tire, but a tire inflation kit, you know, with the, uh, if you get a puncture, you can uh, temporarily seal it. So there's these kinds of equipments in here, tow hook, that kind of stuff. That's all that's in there and that would be enough uh, to put that stuff there. All right, you folks know I'm always big on trying to get in, in and out of vehicles, uh, especially in the second row. Now this should be no problem because it's built for people like myself, right? Nice wide opening, not exactly 90 degrees, but certainly wide enough that you can get in. Again, this option, this vehicle is loaded, has all the power seats, it has the power captain's chairs for the second row, so it's a six seater as opposed to a seven. The seven seater option will give you a bench seat, which I believe has uh, either a 60-40 split or a 20-20-40 uh, split, like a 30-30, uh, something like that, and with a middle piece, but it should slide as well to give you entry and exit. So I think I put this seat a little bit forward than I normally would, probably something about like that, but try getting in here. Grab bar, right, absolutely. No challenges at all. Super, super comfortable place. And as it should be, because this has all the power options, I can go up and down, I can go all kinds of tilt back, all that kind of stuff on this thing. So lots of different ways to move it. There's the 
the option as well for the leg rest that this one has that the other ones have in the front as well so that's if you're let's say at a charging stop or you just want to sleep in the car you can recline this back and just like a recliner at home the leg portion comes up that's an option you have to pay for part of that package but you can get nice and comfortable in here and really have a nice sleep so almost like sitting in a, in a premium economy setup in, a, in an airline lots of space lots of uh, cubbies and stuff for for things uh, i'll bring the camera in and show you a little bit more of this but certainly a very comfortable environment for the rear absolutely fantastic for long trips all right so if i explore some of the interior on this i want to go through some of the details so you can see i've got a pretty good sized bottle here uh, uh holder and it's enough to fit in it with a little bit more of a gap so nothing super huge but adequate for that kind of stuff there is interior lighting on these doors. There's a nice ambient lighting. Again, you have all your your front uh, driver controls here, including memory of driving positions. Um, got your heated seats, cooling seats, heated steering wheel. And then this is, I don't know what that is for. I gotta look that up. If somebody can look that button up. I'll zoom in on it, then you'll figure out what it is. Maybe it's a, a heater. I don't know for what it is, but anyway, maybe it's the leg thing. Anyway, you got your controls here. Power uh, mirrors do fold in, which is nice. So I've been using that a lot for parking in the garage, going through um, drive-throughs, that kind of stuff, getting coffee. So nice premium sound system in here. Works extremely well. Very nice. So again, this is the upgraded package that has all the full complement of options in it. It's fourteen thousand dollars more for for a lot of these options, but you do get the full power suite of seats. All, all different levels, including the comfort, comfy mode. So that's if you want to uh, recline this, um, again, move that bottom out, recline the seat while you're sitting there and to get in a nice, almost comfortable lounge chair mode while you're charging or you would just want to pull over and rest for a bit, you could certainly do that in this vehicle. Really nicely laid out though, uh, front cockpit area here. You have your buttons here for, uh, say for your charging port to open. You've got twice for your front, uh, front hood, front, to get to your front, hold it for your rear traction control, parking, and your uh, illumination for your dash lights. So get into here now. We've got a steering wheel that is a power steering wheel, and it does uh, remember settings. So when you linked it to driver one or driver two settings, it will remember how you have it spaced. Um, as we've seen, uh, nice wheel controls that Kia offers. So let me climb in here and continue the tour. So nice wheel controls that Kia offers. Um, not gonna go through them all, but they're all fairly standard across the board now with your driving ADAS and, and uh, lane keeping adaptive cruise and stuff on this side. And then your modes, you can uh, change, uh, you can set this up for different modes, your um, phone and all that kind of stuff and your radio controls here. And then down here, you've got your drive modes and your terrain. Again, if you're going into snow or some light off-road, you can reset it up. There is no air suspension on this. Uh, I believe there's electronic dampening, and that's what this is going to do is just set some of those dampers a little bit, especially for some of those other modes. And then we've got your standard interface here. We've got a couple of 10-inch screens. I believe they're 10.3 or 10.5. They're kind of linked together with a middle screen. You've got two sections with a small middle. And this is the new kind of look in the UI that I mentioned earlier that they're going after or starting with the Kia Nero the refreshed Nero and moving forward uh, in their product lines, you'll see a lot of similarities. And it's, I really, really like this user interface. I believe the new Hyundai Kona shares it as well that I reviewed recently. So it's a really nice interface, a lot easier to see, a lot easier to navigate. It's not too overly complex, but it gives you everything you need. So obviously you can change screens here uh, to view different things in the middle, right in that middle screen, hold for settings. Um, I've been keeping this as um, a, um, just to see what I'm, I'm how I'm driving uh, from a charging perspective. So I've done, as you can see, I'm not finished yet. I've done 217 kilometers already of range um, at uh, at that. And then here it shows me my remaining range as well, 177. So it's pretty good. And now I know what that button does on the seat, by the way, folks, that I mentioned. This button is like a massage button on the butt. <laughs> I can feel the bottom panel here kind of doing a light air massage. So I'm going to turn that off because I don't want that. But whatever, that's me. Uh, so at least I figured out what that is because this does have, again, some ergonomic and nice seating from that perspective. But you got all your other gauge clusters, driving modes, all that kind of stuff um, that's there. All the inf relative information odometer and battery percentile, which is nice. So as I mentioned, in the, in the and, and you'll see in my driving footage that, you know, you do get some blockage of the steering wheel for this particular part, uh, which is the HVAC controls. These are soft touch controls for the HVAC, so you can do everything you want here. Um, I'm going to turn this off because otherwise it's going to go nuts with auto 
don't want auto on, but you can do that kind of stuff. You could do driver only to save some energy, just having it when it's by yourself or sync it up uh, if you want to uh, to have dual controls and dual, dual elements there. Um, what else? So that's that screen. And then you have your main other 10, 10 and a half inch screen here with lots of haptic uh, controls. So similar to Aria where they kind of built these controls into the dash and you do get a haptic feedback on that when you're pushing these buttons, a home search media, you can set up a favorite and then your setup buttons here. Lots of different things that you can set up on here. Uh, home is kind of where I leave it and you can change these around. So this is the map. Let's say you don't want the map here. You want it here. So you can kind of move these things around like in a card setup. You want your EV stuff to show and set, you know, and to slip in there and then you can do that. So these are kind of quick, easy cards to get to your EV information, which is showing here. All kinds of different stats that you can show on usage, on range history. Again, I reset everything when I got the car. So just to try to get a sense of economy um, and, and how, how I'm driving in this thing to see where I'm going. We had a nice temperature swing, went up to 18 degrees the other day, and now we're at three degrees with a minus something wind chill. So it's been that kind of week of really up and down temperatures, but that's good. You can see how this vehicle has handled those kind of temperatures. These are all kilometers per kilowatt hour, not per not 100 a range, so you'd have to calculate that out, but pretty good. Somewhere, I think, in the area of 25 or 26 um, uh, watt hours, kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, something like that. So you have to look at that and then down into the 20s. So just showing you what's going on, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can set up departure times, all that good stuff in the menus and lots of different, you can do battery uh, conditioning if I want to activate it on low. Let's say I'm, I manually know that I'm going to go somewhere. I just want to warm it up. I can do that. Um, I believe that when you set a charger as a destination, it will automatically start using that. Utility mode is just a bare mode. Different kinds of smart gen. I've, I've set this up for the slower smooth, and that's certainly showing in the, in the adaptive cruise um, element here where it's a really nice deceleration. So I'm glad that you have that option because I really, really like. So this will decelerate strongly, and this will um, the normal app, but I really like the slower smooth because it doesn't get people sick car seat sick and people uh you know if you driving people around in an ev there's so much power it's easy to get people car sick so some these controls are really nice to have and then different voice prompts and that kind of stuff as well that you can set for different elements so lots of settings that you can do here i'm not going to go through all the settings just to let you know that there's lots of capabilities the map and stuff is okay again it's hard to beat some of the others you know mercedes with their with their mbox huge screens and beautiful maps tesla has a really nice screen on the map set up so they're really good but these are adequate right you can nav to somewhere um you can if you want to set up a nav you can look for all that kind of stuff uh, whether it's ch nearby info charging stations um all that kind of stuff uh, you can look it up i haven't really played much with the nav because i haven't needed to i've just been driving around home so lots of good settings and that's how that is again one thing i really really love about this internal um uh, uh dash is these button controls so they blend it in so they don't stick out but they're really important because this changes the temperatures up and down as you can see which are which i use all the time the fan speeds and then here's where i can change the mode if i want it just in the middle i want it on the glass in the bottom then just on the feet just in the middle and the feet I usually run like that when it's cooler um unless i need to defrost so and then you can change so these are nice to have the passenger has their own temperature here as well so these are nice direct air vents you can direct uh you can turn the uh, system on or off for as far as the um sound i'm not going to turn it on because i don't want any copyright strikes but i've been listening to my my xm on 80s most of the time so again nice visuals nice controls everything's laid out easily as i, sh I showed you when i'm driving I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that this does have a regular mirror and a digital mirror so you can do the regular mirror here as you can see and then if i want to just invoke the digital mirror then it uses the camera and i've been kind of running with that just to get used to it some home link settings for three different kinds of garage your sunroof settings so you can certainly um this one is manual so the front part of the sunroof has a manual shade but the back part has a powered one so if you see here i'm closing that shade up uh it doesn't open the roof it's just covering the glass up so if you want some privacy or keep the heat out and then want to open it again just i've been like leaving it leaving it open to get nice and airy cabin here but i'll go back there in a sec nice big mud flaps they do slide as well as well so you put it to the or not bad flaps 
uh, visors, <laughs> getting my terminology mixed up. And they do slide, so they're nice and big, especially for the side windows when you get those afternoon suns, um, all that kind of stuff. Map lights, SOS, if you're connected to the Kia systems for help, that kind of stuff, pretty standard. Charging ports, lots of them. Got a USB-C here. Uh, you can switch it either to data and power or just power only if you just want to charge. If you want it to run, uh, you know, wire your phone here. This does support um, Apple uh, CarPlay and Android Auto. I have not tried it to see if it's wireless, but I suspect that it is because it keeps asking me uh, if I want to turn it on when I have my phone here in the middle. Um, and so uh, without a cable. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that it supports wireless here. And then you've got a, a 120, your uh, lighter kind of plug here, 12 volt. This is a nice setup. I'm going to take out my empty uh, coffee for a sec. I've got just some of my needs here. But this is a nice setup. You can hide some of the stuff in here from prying eyes. Again, everything is nice. So it's got a nice roller setup here. Um, I've been leaving it open just because I have my coffees and stuff. But and these are adjustable. So they're really nice that they set that up. Um, got your buttons here for auto hold for down, going downhill uh, and putting on the cameras if you want to in the parking. Now this is a fingerprint reader. So if I, you have both fobs, you can set this up for biometrics so that you can actually start the car and run it with the fingerprint. I haven't tried that because they don't have both key fobs, but that's something that Genesis started in the GV60 with some of the biometrics. Nice key charging, NFC charging here. Works extremely well. Put your phone, it lights up and charges, tells you on the dash as well. And an okay size center console, nothing huge, but enough to put some change and some stuff in. Uh, and all that kind of stuff because you have really good storage underneath here. If I leave this rolling as I move the camera, let's see if I can get this without shaking you up. So you've got some underneath storage. I've got a ball cap filled with some stuff, but you can put purse. My wife put a purse here the other day. It's illuminated as well. So uh, nice under storage. And that's, we're seeing a common thread in these bigger vehicles. Again, because of that flat floor, right folks, you've got the ability to put all these storage nooks and crannies where you need them. Glove box. Uh, fairly deep, uh, not certainly huge, but deep enough. It's got a big manual in there and that kind of stuff. So you could put a few things. Looks like it's double layered, the glove box. Yep, it is. Got a couple layers so you can throw some stuff in there as well. Pretty hefty, pretty heavy to close. And then I mentioned the HUD. This does have a HUD uh, option. I'm not big on HUDs, but it has it. So I've been using it uh, with the HUD. I've just been leaving it on. So that's the front element. Now let's... Uh, Let's go look at the back or one other thing here is you can also control this seat if you wanted to slide it if the passenger wanted to move it up and down or slide it back and forth um, uh, you can if nobody's in the front there so it's a nice feature we're seeing from that so let's go check out the back now all right checking out the back i'm going to be a little faster here so you go similar small door pockets nothing too extravagant but you can put some stuff in here one thing is nice you have these privacy screens so they do come with a factory tint on the rear uh, from the second row to the back but you also get these additional uh, blockage so if you have kids sleeping or if you need to nap these are great um, we've got some family that have sensitive eyesight so it's nice to be able to block that out and have that and then of course this has again as i mentioned all the power options for the seats that's why it's got it's costing so much as it is and i'll tell you final pricing very adjustable seats they can fold flat all that kind of stuff so i'm not going to spend time in there but they are extremely comfortable and wonderful on a long trip got your hard mat pockets couple of uh, cup holders here for the back passengers, USB-Cs on both seats for power. And this is an option as well that comes with that package. So it's a kind of a cargo container that you pull out and then this tray here slides and then you can go back and throw some stuff in there. I don't believe this is refrigerated, so it's not necessarily for a cooler, but who's to say you couldn't put an ice pack and some pop or something in there if you wanted to, but just a, a nice little element of storage. And then you've got this tray if you wanted to put some you know, McDonald's fries or whatever on there as you're eating on the road trip. So nice little element for that. That's an option and very clean environment, very welcoming. Here you have your rear um, uh, heat controls, uh, HVAC, all that kind of stuff. So if I will let turn it on, yeah, it'll turn it on for me. And then you can position the fans, uh, again, vent fans, so ceiling fans here, change everything the way you like, which is nice to have. So lots of lighting, lots of hooks, lots of grab bars, uh, grab handles, all that kind of stuff. Again, nice open sunroof for the rear passengers here. Now, getting in the back seat. So I'm not going to get in because I showed you that um, in my video before uh, the uh, AJAC one. So I would uh, uh, tell you to go check that one out. 
but basically it's a one button push on the non-power models i believe you have to pull a cord and move slide it over yourself but this is really the space that you get to climb in the back it's definitely enough to climb in the back it's definitely enough i had somebody come sit in here and it's definitely enough room to sit you can move the seats up there are some controls back here i believe so that you can adjust the seat in front of you Oh no, that's these seats. Okay, so these back seats, because they're power, they recline as well. So if you want to recline on a trip and sleep a little bit, USB-C port here, um, and you have a couple of nice cup holders and stuff to put stuff in, little cubbies to put stuff in here. So it's okay. Again, if you're small enough to fit comfortably on a longer trip, then great. They are really nice, comfortable seats. Uh, somebody that's taller for a long, long period of time, you'd have to move these seats forward a little bit, but you can, you've got lots of room to move these and still have leg room, right? Like the seats are way forward. So you can get comfortable. And that's the whole point of this third row. It's a very usable third row. There's good headroom space and there's good areas to use this. So that's my, that's my point is that Kia has built this. You can see the roof line doesn't, you know, do a sharp uh, dive here. It stays level where it is. It doesn't kind of dip down because they want to give you the headroom. They want to give you the room to actually use this backseat facility. That's what the third row is for. Not just charge some money and plunk a couple of seats and say it's got a third row and then trying to actually get people in there is a challenge like you know normal sized people right not just kids like just adults that want to jump in too so i'm really really um thankful that key has put a lot of thought around this and ergonomics around the whole uh, seating uh side of things and then um and then made it happen right and then again this has the power option so when you want to put that seat back you just press the one button and off it goes to the position that it was and then you can readjust it so really really pleasant environment here that key has thought of both in the front and the rear very usable space and again you can see this roof line stays flat right it stays relatively flat so that's because they want to maintain that headroom and that usability from not only for passengers but think about it for stuff it's all part of being able to utilize this utility vehicle that's what the unsuv means utility and and you know if you build these things where they're really aerodynamic and two-shaped the amount of room and stuff you can get in there is a lot less. And for people that need that kind of element to be able to, to maximize the space, it means also more space for customers and a much more comfortable, and, or for uh, passengers, excuse me, and that means a much more comfortable environment for them. And that's what it's all about. All right, just give you some of my quick driving thoughts here as I'm driving around with the EV9. Um, I mean, I can't say enough how good this vehicle is folks um you get a really beautiful upright high seating position right you can see everything around here it's really nice it's big enough that you have the room and you you do know that it's a big suv yet it's maneuverable enough to maneuver where it needs to be this doesn't have rear wheel steering so it won't turn as sharp as some of the other longer um, uh, vehicles that are on the market that have that supported rear wheel steering but I have I've had no problems in navigating parking lots parking spaces all that kind of stuff getting in and out of places with this thing it's been no problem at all a little more width obviously in length it's got really great cameras as well here for 360 different angles the virtual it's got everything from a from a camera perspective so you don't have to worry about that of course the 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 side view indicators come on with the turn signals, which is the South Korean flavor now on all their vehicles. But from a driving dynamics, it's very comfortable, lots of great visibility everywhere. Um, whether you like the digital rear view or not, they both work really well. Um, suspension absorbs the, the bumps very nicely. Um, again, this isn't air or adjustable. It's a uh, the standard suspension, but it does a really nice job. Um, you do feel, you know, if you're going over some big bumps, you'll wobble a bit, but it cushions it nice, nice enough that you don't really have to worry about it keeps everybody um, in a nice composure when you're driving this vehicle and that's to be expected remember this is I think somewhere around 6,000 pounds so it's got a lot of weight that's thrown around but very planted because a lot of that weight is in the lower part of this vehicle right low and flat and centered so handles really well um, you know got no problems in doing emergency maneuvers that kind of stuff this is the uh, steering is responsive I find and these are running snow tires right now so they're gonna be a little softer than normal tires will in all seasons. We've had our temperatures go up and down this week, so I'll give you a, a bit of a range uh, scenario coming up here. Uh, once I'm done uh, driving the vehicle, I'll document it and show you what that is. But 
you know, this has just been an extremely uh, pleasant vehicle to drive, easy to drive too. Um, right now I'm driving around this quiet little suburban part in Caledon and uh, it's very nice, a very quiet vehicle. Right? You don't hear any motor whine at all, zero. Just uh, where the tires hit the road, a little bit of air noise, wind noise when you're going into the wind on the highway. Again, this is a big box, right? It's a big rectangle. So you're going to hear some of that wind but Kia has done a great job of keeping the occupants comfortable, keeping it quiet for the occupants, and keeping it obviously very safe because that's what EVs, especially all electrics, are. So what else can I say about the driving? The brakes are very well. I don't find them mushy at all. Uh, I kind of been using a little bit of both, um, only because the iPedal is really nice. Again, all these iPedal integrations, implementations, excuse me, that Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis have done all work phenomenally well. I just found with this amount of weight and stuff, sometimes it was just a little jerky. Just ever so, you know, it's hard to explain. Um, I'm lucky that because I get so many vehicles to drive and I have my own Model 3 as well to compare against, that I those kind of set, you know, the benchmarks. And I can tell some of the smaller nuances in some of these systems. So um, I just found it's just not as smooth as me being able to do it that way with the level three and the brakes. But, you know, you will be able, be able to choose what you want. And the good thing is that Kia has given you the choice. They give you the choice of multiple modes. I've left it on eco mode all the time just because I'm driving normal. But even in eco mode, if I give it some, <laughs> there we go. Like I got up to 60 kilometers an hour in a heartbeat there in, in eco mode. So you don't necessarily need to run it in sport mode and all these things all the time. You can. It's up to you. You're, you're going to lose your range, but that's totally up to you. So, um, again, this handles really well. I've just been driving it normal. Keep up with speeds, whatever the case is, keeping it safe. And this uh, is phenomenal. I love the steering wheel. It's got a nice feel to it. Um, that bit of an oval shape, um, that the grasp is nice. Again, all the controls, as I mentioned, are really easy to see the visibility. That's it. I mean, this is just a fantastic vehicle. It's not a sports car. Don't drive it like one. This is a family hauling, stuff hauling, full SUV. And that's what it should be driven. It should be driven with respect because it, it has a lot of power for what these things have and a lot of weight. So you need to understand that. Um, but I've, you know, this, this handles phenomenally, goes like stink. And, the, you know, again, if you drive it normally, you get exceptional range and good driving and handling characteristics out of this. So, again, a big thumbs up to Kia. The, the, for for building a uh, an, an exceptional exceptional platform here on this EV9 and then using this as the benchmark moving forward now when they're starting to bring out more of their all electric lineup over the next few years so I look forward to more all right just thought I'd show you the lane keeping assist and the um, uh, yeah <laughs> adaptive cruise that's what I was trying to think of it's early in the morning thought I'd get in, in a little bit of darkness today so you can probably see the HUD up there showing some of the details. Uh, if I zoom in on that, so you can see it's pretty comprehensive, nice, easy to see HUD. Um, so that's one good thing. And I haven't touched the wheel now since I started this recording. So you can see it's set, it, even in this uh, little bit of darkness, it's navigating those uh, medians, uh, concrete mediums quite well, um, and keeping the lane very, very nice, not going back and forth, not ping-ponging keeping the speed nice now obviously this doesn't have traffic light awareness or stop signs or anything of like that so this is strictly adaptive cruise with lane keeping and you need to um, you need to make sure that you have control of this now there it lost it in the intersection and that's fairly typical with most of these systems it's not like Tesla where they'll maintain the the lane visibility through an intersection um, a lot of them do lose it because they, they lose so uh, one lane marking or another, or both. Uh, this one does pretty good. Um, again, it lost it there, but then it start, restarted again automatically, the uh, adaptive cruise and the speed and the lane keeping. And now it's slowing down for this truck. I have it set for four spaces, which is the maximum distance. Um, I do like it that it's uh, breaking it to a nice smooth uh, slow down and not uh, abrupt changes in speed where it's gonna you know like hammer the accelerator to get you going and then wait to the last minute to uh, um, to slow down so I'll change the distance all right so I'm just uh, doing the lane keeping and uh, adaptive cruise control again here this time in the daytime so you can see a little better gave you some nighttime footage so hopefully I'm not sure if you can see the HUD there um, it indicates a green steering wheel, indicates the speed that I've got it set for and the spacing dif difference. And right now, because that vehicle is going slower, uh, the one in front of me, than the set speed that I've set, it's just basically keeping the vehicle in that square. If I 
I zoom in here, which is that line that you see the block on top of. That's the, second, the, the vehicle in front of me. So it just kind of keeps it at that space. Unless it goes faster than my set speed, then it will open up the distance. So it's pretty good at maintaining that. Uh, you can see the steering wheel hardly moves at all, which is very small turns back and forth and uh, no ping ponging. Um, the timeout is pretty long on this, at least for this particular vehicle. Um, hasn't really asked me to put the hands on the steering wheel for quite some time, uh, in excess of a couple of minutes now, to be honest with you. Um, I did go through an intersection, then it asked me to grab the wheels, so I guess it's going to be dependent on circumstances and what the camera is picking up and the, all the vision systems there. But as you can see, doing a nice job keeping the uh, vehicle nice in the lane, nice and smooth. And one of the things I've noticed, uh, I think I said it on the last little bit there, is that the um, the system for accelerating and decelerating when you're in the adaptive cruise is very nice. I think they've they've tweaked it. Kia's done a great job of smoothing it down. And what I mean by that is that it will actually anticipate slowing down sooner than a lot of the other systems will. So it won't be so abrupt and aggressive. So here's a great situation where we've got a light. It's asking me to keep hands on the wheel finally. So I've nudged it. I'm still not holding the wheel, not touching the pedals. And it's slowing down fairly gradually. I mean, I'm not really, there's not a lot of uh, the deceleration here that's aggressive that's throwing me forward. It's actually really, really nice and smooth. It's a stop that I would do. I would brake a little sooner and come to a nice smooth stop. And and the only thing I would say is I'd probably leave it a little bit more distance than the vehicle in front of me, uh, only because I'm old school and I was taught that if you don't see the rear wheels touching the ground of the car in front of you, then you're too close. But that's me. This has a long front end, so it just uh, still has lots of space. But that stop was extremely smooth. Now, he will get an acceleration and we'll see what that's like. So, oh, I got to tap the pedal. There we go. Okay, so I, you have to push the pedal on it or push the... Um, uh, the restart button, I guess, which is the resume button down here, which you see the circle to get it going. So once I did that, it accelerated up to speed very nicely and very smoothly. And as it's uh, again increasing speed, trying to catch up to match the speed that I have it set for, which in this case is displayed there on that green, I can zoom in on that, on that green part of the uh, HUD. And uh, now it's uh, it basically hit that speed and it's going to just back off a little bit and then keep the space of the car in front of me because it's going a bit slower. So very nice system, very good systems. I love that they continue to improve them and make them smoother because I really don't like these abrupt systems that just kind of take you to a stop really quick, um, like late in the braking cycle and then accelerate quite hard to get you up to speed. Um, I, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of finesse being put in these systems and Kia has done it extremely well. Just wanted to try the highway drive assist, the lane uh, changing. It does have it, but it only comes on uh, when you hit over 100 kilometers an hour, I believe, uh, because you can see that it's got the um, left and right turn indicators next to that green steering wheel. So I'm gonna try to do a right uh, lane change. There's nobody there, nobody in my blind spot. It's all clear, so I'm just gonna signal. And then, there we go, and then the car itself moves and ask me to keep hands on the steering wheel. Okay, and that's it. So it lost it there because I didn't put my hands on the steering wheel fast enough during that signal. So I'm going to try it again after and see if I can do a little smoother. But it, uh, it changed the lane pretty smooth. It's just that um, during that process, it was asked me to keep my hand on the wheel, and I didn't. So that's my bad. But it's a nice feature. It does it pretty smooth. Um, I held the stock down, put it all the way. So I think what you just have to do is just tap it lightly so you get like the lane change as a indicator as opposed to your uh, like you're making a right turn or a left turn something along those lines so I'm just going to try it again after this next um, vehicle comes up here just give myself a little space keep everything safe as I'm uh, following these guys ahead of me so I'm going to do that so I still have lane keeping assist on adaptive cruise on and it's showing me that I can do that lane change so now I'll do it so all I'm going to do is just tap and then the signal starts changing and as we see okay so somebody came beside me and that was pretty smart the car wouldn't let me do it okay so let's try this again now now I've got it should be not be anybody in my blind spot keep hands on the wheel all right so you have to keep your hands on the wheel for that maneuver it won't do it without it and then it stops the signal okay now I figured it out three times a charm so um to activate, you do have to have your hands on the wheel. It, it won't do it fully without it. 
it's a safety feature, but it does it nice and smooth, checks the blind spot, because again, the second time I did it, there was somebody that uh, the last second came into my blind spot and uh, it stopped doing its lane change and it beeped. So pretty smart system. I like the way they do things. All right, since I'm just talking about driving and ergonomics before, um, obviously you're, you're seeing a lot of the interior and details, just, uh, just nitpicking here on some of the points. Again, this is a fantastic vehicle. It was really hard for me to find a lot wrong with it, uh, especially in these early production vehicles that they've done a great job. I would say right now, so this is where my eye line is while I'm driving and, and trust me folks, I'm still being safe here. But as you can see, the steering wheel blocks a little bit of the, of the display for me uh, based on that, based on comfort level. I, I could raise the steering wheel of course and to put it up a little higher uh, but I do uh, I do like it a tad lower and then the other element is this part of the steering wheel blocks the HVAC um, displays so th this part of the third of the screen here is uh, uh, the HVAC stuff and then the rest of this is the the different cards uh, with the different elements here on this bigger screen and um, that steering wheel kind of blocks that so you see if I go around you can see it if I go like here you can see what I'm talking about. It's flashing because uh, that's just the video frame rate. It doesn't flash in real life, but these are the controls. Now, these are soft controls, so you could touch them. But again, a good thing about this vehicle, it does have hard touch controls, so you can change things like temperature, fan speed, and mode, where the direction of the wind is coming from, all with these buttons up and down. Really nice, easy solution. But you know, like if I wanted to sync, I have the air synced. If I just wanted to driver only, I've got to touch that button there. If I wanted to put rear to fog, I got to do that. And Again, when you're here, uh, those are blocked. So you kind of just have to move around to get you. You will get used to that, but that's just a little bit of a nitpicking thing, I would say right now, uh, from from the overall ergonomics of the, the driver and, and uh, the dash layout. Everything else on the steering wheel is excellent. The paddles, stocks, everything works extremely well, easy to get to, no issues there. Um, again, all the other controls here for seated heating. I did say uh, before that I, these are a little hard to see in the daytime when it's bright out. Like now you'll see that I can that I put the, the heated seats on, kind of. Um, so they're a little hard to see because they're facing this way. At nighttime, it's no problem. That would be another pet, little small ergonomic thing, but you know, I don't know what you can do, make them brighter, I don't know, but uh, it's not the big, uh, not a big deal. Uh, otherwise, visibility is good. Um, I've got the digital rear camera going because I have some stuff in the back. If I switch it back, you can see that um, I've got some stuff there, so I, it's blocking a little bit. The headrests are up in the third row and I'm blocking some stuff. So if I put this digital camera on, I get a nice clean feed behind me um, and you can change some of the brightness aspects and, and move it a little bit up and down from the outside part of the camera view. So these are just some of the things that I, you know, I kind of focus on when I'm driving is the ergonomics and, and the, the ease of use for a lot of the functions and the displays. You know, these, this has haptic feedback. Of course, if I want to go to a quick control uh, element here and do things, since the start button's over here, which is a little unique on this uh, changing stock like the Ionix, uh, Ionix have, but that's a little bit different. But that's okay. Once you get it, it's, uh, it's good. So Overall, they've done a great job in the ergonomics and being able to reach everything, being able to understand the layout and get everything done. And All right, going to do a quick uh, DC fast charging because as a new car, let's see how it charges and how the curve is. I'm here at a electrified Canada station. It's in a hyper fast, so it's up to 350 watt, 350 kilowatt of charging here. So I'm going to pull in. Hopefully it'll work because I know electrified Canada, the gremlins are a hit and miss sometimes with here. So let me see if I can get it going and show you what it pulls. And just for context, I'm at 6% state of charge. I did set this as a destination, so it did do some battery preheating as well along the way, um, showing about 40, about 20 kilometers or so left of range. So I'm on the, on the edge here. Let's see how I do. All right, so I've initiated the charging and let's see as it starts uh, going here. Again, this is a 350 watt hyper fast as they call it. All right, so it's starting to kick up at 39 kilowatts, 45, let's see. It says 29 minutes until 80. Now, right now it's one degree, two degrees with the wind chill. It's a negative Celsius temperatures right now. It did do some battery warming, so we'll see how much of that warmth actually uh, made it to the battery. Still crank it up at 87, 88. I'm at 7% state of charge. I'm gonna try to do that 20 minute and see what I can get if we can get to 80 in that time. This says 29. All right, just to show you what it sees on the dash, it does tell you the um, pull. 
So as you can see here, it's ramping up to 120, 125, continuing to go here, 130. I like that. Boy, keep going, keep going. You can see it's three degrees C, but there's a really cool wind. We've already hit some snow squalls and ice. It's all kinds of stuff going on today. So kind of a weird day weather-wise, but let's see. So it's telling me still uh, to get to 100, it's 56 minutes, but I'm only going to 80, so it'll be about 28 minutes according to this graph. Looks like it's leveled at 142 kilowatts. Uh, still going on a good clip here, 17%, 146 kilowatts. You can see it here as well as in the main display. So I like that uh, Kia gives you all kinds of places to display the information. I've set the charging limit to 80% just so that the time would be right and show me what I've got. I'm up to 64 kilometers of range, 24 minutes remaining at 18%, pulling up 146. I'll continue to monitor. Just watching it hit 30% here and it's actually cr uh, climbed up to 203 kilowatts, as you can see, and 24 and it's maintaining that level now. It's been doing that for a couple minutes, so uh, pretty nice. As the battery heats up and it starts getting some, uh, some nice warmth into it, um, we're seeing some more pull, so I'll keep going. Just chugging away here at 65%, still floating around the 190 kilowatt range for the last uh, oh, while since the 40 percentile range. So nice uh, flat charging curve, I like that. Let's see how it goes when it gets into the 70s, 70, 75s. See what we can remain charging, uh, pull up to 80%. Still chugging away here, just over 70%. Got a few more minutes to go on this electrified Canada. As you can see, it's starting to snow. Like we're getting, man, what a weird day today is. It's up and down like a yo-yo, but uh, this thing's coming away. No problem, everything's going well. Um, yeah, I'm excited about getting the final numbers and seeing what this thing looks like. All right, hit my 80%, still pulling about 80 kilowatts. Let me unplug it. All right, I'm all done the charging. I'm, let's uh, show you the analysis. I'm gonna chart everything out and we're gonna walk through it and I'll give you my feedback. And uh, yeah, now the snow's coming down even harder. So finish just in time. All right, so let's look at that charging summary here. It actually looks pretty good, as you can see, not very good at doing graphs and stuff, by the way, folks, but uh, basically in 29 minutes, I went from 6% state of charge to 80% state of charge. So it's a little bit more than the stated 20, 22 minutes, but it was a below 10%, first of all, and it's a lot colder. So in, in those numbers are always in prime, you know, like 20 degrees temperatures. As you can see, I went from 6 to 80%. I started at 88 uh, kilowatts for a pull, maxed out at 205 was the, the most I could see and then uh, went back down to 83 by 80%. So when I look at this, this is a really nice charging curve and I know that Kyle would be uh, really happy with this at out of spec. It's, uh, we like to see a, a decent ramp up and a nice leveling for as long as possible in these curves and then not so drastic a decline um, like Tesla does as an example. You can finish at 85% at around 30 kilowatts. So. Um, this is a really nice charging curve. I think this is going to be excellent for long road trips. If the weather had been warmer and temperatures, uh, again, uh, into the normal 20s, I probably would have done this in less time. Just quickly, I want to talk about the range and efficiency that I experienced in this vehicle. Um, over the five days, six days that I drove it, I drove 351 kilometers. As you can see there, had 22 remaining. Uh, weather temperature was all over the place from minus five to plus 18. We had quite a swing week in weather. Look at the numbers. So um, did a distance of 351 kilometers, as I mentioned. The range started at 400, ended at 22. So that would be an estimate of 49 kilometers left. Um, the actual was actual uh, 371 kilometers if I look at that. So there's a difference of about 29 kilometers, which is about 7% range loss. And that's more than adequate for the temperatures. Um, and it's actually very good um, for, from a range loss, especially when you start getting into the cooler temperatures. So that means that the, the range estimates are pretty good. Uh, not a whole lot of error in that. Uh, I would say I think 7% is quite reasonable. So uh, in eight, the ability to do 300 kilometers easily in cool weather is quite achievable with that vehicle. And that's just normal everyday driving. You could see the efficiencies were four kilometers per kilowatt hour, or I like to look at the numbers as 25 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So all in all, very good for such a big EV. And again, Kia and those South Koreans, they really know what they're doing. 
All right, so I hope you enjoyed a lot of those details because I really wanted to kind of focus on this vehicle because it's that important for Kia. This is a flagship vehicle for them and this is a switch in their direction of a lot of their design language and where they're, what they're doing with electrification. So it's that critical that you kind of understand their thought process and all about this vehicle and well thought out. There's a lot of things in here that they've considered for consumers and for occupants. And I'm extremely happy with what they put together here now. Now let's talk about pricing because we know that all electrics are more money, right? And I'm gonna talk about the price points on this, how it fares to competitors, and how it also fares to a gas powered equivalent, right? Because I get that asked that a lot. So, so here in Canada, there's three trim levels that are available. Again, you have to check your region for how they call them, what they name them, and what's, op what's available. Here we have the light rear wheel drive, we have the wind rear wheel drive, and the land all wheel drive. Those are the three trim models. The base price on this vehicle for the light rear wheel drive model, single motor, seven passenger, as I mentioned, um, is 59995 Freight, PDI, destination, all those stuff are extra and taxes are extra. Does all models, by the way, qualify for the $5,000 federal rebate? And they also qualify for any provincial rebates, including Quebec, right now that they still have them, and BC. So 59995 Get a single motor, seven passenger, gets you the EGMP, fast charging, gift structure, all that kind of stuff. Now, highway driving assist two, 19 inch wheels go up to the upgrade to the wind and the biggest difference is you get the larger battery pack so the light is the standard range battery pack that i mentioned earlier and the wind gives you the updated almost 100 kilowatt hour battery pack and that's the one that i would go for personally uh, you get a heat pump as well in that model and upwards and that's pretty important in the winter for saving some energy you get a heated steering wheel and you get that 490 kilometer range or 489 kilometers on that and that's a base price of 62,995 so you go up a couple of grand again that to me is the sweet spot then you factor in your incentives and all that stuff you can come out of that you know that's basically model y pricing right around there from a tesla perspective for a very competent seven passenger um, single motor long range type of vehicle you want all-wheel drive like this one is and you upgrade to the land all-wheel drive that's another couple of grand starting at 64,995 Canadian. Gets you the dual motors, right? The more horsepower, more torque. Gets you the terrain drive modes and about 450 kilometer of the ranges. So you lose, let's say 40, 50 kilometer of, of EPA range, but you get that back with, uh, with the all wheel drive capability and the, fat, the more power. So if power is very much a concern for you, then uh, this is the one that you want to look at. But again, I'm, I'm mixed because it depends. If I'm living in a city, I'm not really doing a ton of country driving and if I do go out in the winter on country roads I'm going out when they're plowed already then I don't really know if I need to spend on a wheel drive but that's a personal thing up to you now only with that all-wheel drive land model can you add some couple of premium packages so you can upgrade it add another 10,000 for a premium package that's what it's called that gives you the six passenger seating like you've seen here 20 inch wheels gives you um, some LED headlamps the, the cube stuff the dual sunroof digital lighting as well for the grill and the base patterns and vehicle to load technology for outside and inside so that's cool that they still offer the vehicle to load technology in these as well or you can upgrade spend four grand more instead of the 10 uh, add 14 grand and get the GT line package and that's what this version has the entitled the entire uh, it's the all-wheel drive with the GT line package you get 21 inch wheels you get the whole more digital lighting systems more GT line design elements you get this front passenger power leg lifts right in those seats you get the second row power leg rests so for you know that lounge seating you get a heads-up display in that option you get the power fold and unfold for the third row as you saw me operate in the cargo segment you get that option so um, you know, really good, right? Really, really good specs. So that means that if I look at this tester model, let me get my papers here because the wind's blowing around. This tester came out at about $81,495 before taxes. It's got everything in, freight, PDI, the $14,000 option, but uh, without sales tax, it's $81,495. So that is a lot of money, but if you want all the goodies, it's that's what you're going to get. So let me now talk to you about the price comparisons all right so as i mentioned that's pretty pricey but we, when we look at the comparisons and that's where you know that's why i looked at this vehicle and named it my ev of the year because a i understand the full-size suv market is hot 
there's not a lot of affordable full-size three-row e all-electrics that are in the market today. And, um, you know, meeting that, that consumer demand with this kind of vehicle at that price point I just mentioned is, is a really hard thing to do, and Kia has done that. So if we look at the competitors, these are the competitors that, that are here in Canada that, uh, that you can either order or that will be delivered this year that have a third row and that are only all electric. So I'm not talking about plug-in hybrids. I'm only talking about all electric vehicles. We have the VinFast VF9. Starts at $106,000 Canadian, starting MSRP. We have the Mercedes-Benz EQS, their full-size SUV, three-row, starts at $136,000 Canadian. Okay, remember this starts at $59,995 Canadian. So remember that. Uh, I'm going to come back to Mercedes because they do have an option that's really close to this. Tesla Model X, right? Model X has been out there a long time. It's a beautiful machine. Starts at $118,000 Canadian. One one eight thousand Canadian for the third row option. You've got the Rivian R1S, right? You saw my video a couple shows ago, go check it out. Got a big, nice, big, comfortable third row back there, a big vehicle, lots of stuff you can do with it. What's its base price? Well, $112,500 Canadian, starting base price, starting. Last but not least, Volvo has announced, and you, uh, I talked about it a little bit out of the uh, car show episode a few weeks ago, their EX90. That has a third row option, or it's their larger SUV with a third row option. What's the starting price on that, you ask? $110,000 Canadian, starting. So, everything that I've mentioned so far starts at over $100,000. $40,000 more than this starts at, okay? And I'm just, I'm just measuring base prices, the base prices for EVs that have three rows, all electrics that have three rows. That's what I'm measuring, right? So you can see there's a huge disparity in the price point, right? The only, there is one though, all electric that comes from a major uh, manufacturer that's available that does have a third row that has a very close starting price to Kia. And surprisingly, it's the Mercedes Benz EQB, B is in Bob, 250. Spending the extra thousand bucks or so for the third row on that vehicle will come in at about $61,000 Canadian as a starting price. Wow, you're going a Mercedes for the same price as this? Hey, why wouldn't I get the Mercedes, right? Well, if you look at these, the, the, and I encourage you to go online, look at the dimensions, look at the size, look at the cargo volumes, look at, you know, they give you all the specs for knee room, leg room, head room, all that kind of stuff, shoulder room. Look at them all and look at the, compare the two vehicles. EQB is a wonderful vehicle, but it's much smaller than this. So you don't get that more boxy room that this thing provides to give you more space in all those elements that I mentioned earlier. Plus, the third row on the EQB is extremely small. Watch my video review. If you look at comparisons, that's why, that was one of the main reasons why I picked this as my EV of the year. Not just because I'm hung up on Kia and I'm hung up on the South Koreans. It's nothing to do with that. I'm just looking at the market, the wants, the desires, the needs of those markets, and what is a great vehicle to satisfy it. And again, Kia has hit a home run with the EV9. But what about their Telluride? product. It's an excellent product. It's an ice internal combustion. There are some flavors of that, I believe. Might be a plug-in hybrid version. I, I don't remember. Uh, I just looked at the ice, the internal combustion version to try to compare costing on this just to see how it fares. So remember, the base price on this starts $60,000, right? So base price on the Tell you, tell you Ride with the EX trim in Canada is about $51,000. So about $9,000 less. All Tellurides come with a 3.6 liter V6, giving you 291 horse and 262 pound-feet of torque. Um, fuel economy, EPA rated is about 11.7 liters per 100 kilometers. Combined, um, it take, has an 18.8 gallon tank, about 71 liters to fill that up. So, if I look at the base EV9, because I'm trying to keep the price points similar, right? At 70, that lower uh, uh, standard range pack at 76 kilowatts. Base price on that that I uh, figured out uh, is about 60245 if I'm comparing trim levels with the EX on the Telluride. Um, and then I deduct my federal tax and all that stuff. I'm at 55820 before I add the tax and all that stuff. So I'm only at about $5,000 more now than the Telluride. Uh, and again, the specs-wise, I get 215 horse, 258 of torque. 
on the Telluride, I get 291 horse, 262. Now the torque is really what gets you going. You got a full load, it's not the horsepower that gets you moving, it's the torque that gets you from zero to 40, 50, 60 kilometers an hour, and then the horsepower will kick in to, to accelerate you once you're moving faster. So torque wise, these are very, very similar in specs, right? And they'll get people going. So single motor on the um, EV9 base has a range, as I mentioned, EPA range of 370 kilometers. So if I factor in some driving elements, if I factor in uh, driving 18,000 kilometers a year of driving, let's factor in the cost of the Telluride EX versus the EV9 base single motor. But if we look at that 18,000 18, kilometers per year that I'm going to drive, the cost for gas is about $3,200 if we just use the numbers, based on about a buck fifty a liter. 18,000 kilometers a year, gas $3,200. Electricity cost for home charging $370. You know, almost uh, over a $2,500 a year difference in savings. So even if the base EV9 is costing me $5,000 more than the Telluride. Uh, at $2,500 a year of savings, I'll make that difference up in two years and then I'm saving money moving forward. Folks, that's what you have to look at. So when you hear people say all electrics are for the rich, they're too expensive, you got to sit down and work the numbers and see how it fits for you, right? 80% or more of EV owners home charge. They have the ability to charge at home, whether it's through a 110 or they have put a level two. If you don't have that, you have to look at your case, what you have near you for fast charging, what those rates would be based on your driving habits and figure out the costing. It could cost more than the gas to do that. It could, depending on where you are, right? Some of those uh, DC fast charging rates are quite high in some of the regions in North America. So you've got to do the math. But that's where I encourage you is to get educated, do the math, and look it up, right? Look all that information up and write it down and get factual. And just by looking at the financials, this is a winner. And again, the reason why, another reason why this is my EV pick of the year and a really solid choice for an all-electric environment. So I hope that this helps in formulating some sort of an opinion about this vehicle. All right, so I was able to get a little bit of a sun come out to warm me up a little bit and the wind to break a little bit. But hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode of my coverage on a really important vehicle and something that I think is a game changer for the full-size SUV all-electric marketplace in the Kia EV9. There's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes for this vehicle to make it extremely pleasant. So I want to thank Kia Canada again for allowing me the use of this vehicle. Super stoked to be able to get to uh, spend some time with it and drive it around. And I'm so and much more now eagerly anticipating the EV5 that you'll start that you've already uh, there's already videos out there from South Korea on that model, which is really this just scaled down to a five passenger. But if, but I'm very very stoked on Kia uh, as I mentioned. They've been doing, the South Koreans have just done phenomenal stuff on their battery management, on, on their offerings, um, and uh, they just continue to shine. So until the next episode, I hope you enjoyed this. Everybody stay safe. Thank you very much. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the YouTube comments, or you can email me directly at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, get your emails and answer them and go from there. So again, thank you very much. And until the next episode, everybody stay safe and I'll see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.